We are in the second week of a series that we do every year in the summertime called What's Up With That? For the sake of our guests, let me explain. In the late spring, I ask our church family to send me any question they have about Christianity, about our culture, a doubt that they have, a real-life personal issue that they have, doesn't much matter. Nothing is off-limits, nothing is taboo. And I say to them, why don't you ask me these questions, and then over the course of the summer, usually it takes between six and eight weeks, we'll answer some of your very questions over the course of this series we call What's Up With That? This year, somebody asked me this question. And as in years past, uh, one of the kinds of questions that tend to get raised in this series are like this. Um, they could be controversial questions, certainly hard questions, certainly complicated questions. The kinds of questions that lots of Christians and lots of churches have very strong opinions about. We're going to take two weeks to really only scratch the surface on trying to give you a good answer to this question. Um, let me start by saying that if you've had any church experience at all in the late 20th century, early 21st century in America, then you have seen this subject be a very contentious, exceedingly divisive issue. In fact, if you're like me, you have probably sat in churches where you were told what to think about this issue. And moreover, you were warned about what not to think about this issue. And then maybe you went to a college science class and you were told the exact opposite. And there you were, not knowing what to do. Um, let me go ahead and just say this at the outset. My goal, as is the case in most of the questions that you ask me year to year in this series, my goal is not to convince you to believe what I do. You don't have to. My goal is not to tell you what the right thing is, and to have all of you fall into line after it. See, at our church, you can think differently about this subject. Yes, there are a few basics that we all need to affirm together, but when you move outside of those basics, it's okay if we disagree and don't understand it the same way. And that alone makes the way we're going to talk about this distinct from the way you might hear it talked about other places. It's okay with me if you're a young earth creationist, which means you read Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 very literally and think that the world and the universe is only several thousands of years old. That's okay. You can do that. You can be an old earth creationist and think that God created in seven literal days, but that the world is older than a few thousand years. That's fine. You can believe in intelligent design, that God is very obviously uh, involved in the creation of all things, and His intelligence and His design is seen in the way that the universe and life works. That's fine if you want to think that. You can be a theistic evolutionist and think that God used the process of evolution to create all the things that we see and know in the world. That's okay. At our church, you are allowed to do that. And that makes us distinct. Today, this is what I want to focus on. And it is the only thing that we're going to talk about today. Next week, we're going to move on to several other subjects and emphases. Today, I want to take you back to the actual biblical account of creation, which you would find in the first book in your Bible, Genesis, and namely the first two chapters. Now see, here's the thing. You, if you have church experience, have probably heard someone who had a very strong opinion about creation and evolution say something like, 
well, if you only believed what the Bible said, then you would come to my conclusion. Or, if you only took the Bible seriously, then you would come to my conclusion. And Christians are very bad about this. What we do is we already come to the conclusion that we want, and then we go back and make the Bible say it. Now here's my contention to you, and we're going to spend the rest of the time looking into this in greater depth. Most of us don't understand Genesis 1 and 2 the way that an ancient Hebrew, the original audience of the book, would have. Today what I want to do for you is liberate the first two chapters of the Bible from the argument of the last hundred years in American Christianity about creationism or evolution. I want you to see that those first two chapters in the Bible are powerful and moving and have lots to say, but they rise above this binary conflict between creationism and evolution. I want to rescue the Bible, if you will, from what we think we want it to say to what it actually says. And what you're going to find is, wow, you know, there's a lot of space in what those two chapters have to say for us to maybe disagree on the particulars or how evolution may or may not be involved but we're going to be good students today of Scripture and let it speak. Let it, ha let it have its own voice. We are going to hear it say what it has always been trying to say, but we've kind of missed it. Now, to do that, we need to talk about the setting of Genesis 1 and 2. The book of Genesis was written by Moses, sometime around 1500 B.C. It was written to the ancient nation of Israel, the primary focus or protagonist of your Old Testament, God's people in the Old Testament. The heritage of the Jewish people comes from Mesopotamia, which is contemporary Iraq. Their cultural background, this goes back to people like Abraham and Isaac, their cultural background would have been Babylonian, or it would have been Mesopotamian. But, even more to the point, when Genesis 1 and 2 is written, they're coming out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Another dominant superpower and culture in the ancient world. And you think, okay, I, I don't get it. Why is that important? Well, see, these cultures were saying something loudly about creation, about God, about how those two things work together. The culture back then, some 3,500 years ago, had a set view of how creation and God all work. And Genesis 1 and 2 is written to defy those cultural expectations or perspectives. It was written to tell the nation of Israel, oh, everything that you're hearing from the cultures around you, yeah, it's pretty much wrong. And let me tell you instead the way you should think about the origin of the universe and life. And humanity. I want you to experience this the way that somebody in 1500 BC would have. And to do that, you need to be familiar with the way that the world in 1500 BC thought about creation, thought about the origin of the cosmos, etc. To do that, I'm going to tell you in brief the most famous creation tale that existed in the culture at the time. And it is called Enuma Elish. It finds its origin in ancient Mesopotamia. Here's the story of Enuma Elish. This is what every Hebrew before Genesis 1 and 2 would have believed about the creation of the world. 
as well as every non-Hebrew. At the beginning of Enuma Elish, we are told that there are two gods. There is a father god and a mother god. The father god is associated with fresh water. The mother god is associated with seawater. Their names are Apsu and Tiamat. Apsu and Tiamat have four generations of children. So they have sons, they have grandsons, they have great-grandsons, and they have great-great-grandsons. This is the first plot item in the story. All those younger gods, all those four generations of younger gods, they're running around and doing their things, and it is said that those younger gods disturb mom and dad, Apsu and Tiamat. And so like any good parents, they decide, gosh, those kids are getting under our skin. We're going to kill them. It's right there. I'm not making it up. And so the younger gods learn of Apsu and Tiamat's plot to kill them for disturbing them. And they send one of the younger gods named A to sneak into their father's bedchamber, lull him to sleep, and murder him. And then, after the fact, that younger god builds his house upon the dead body of his murdered father. I don't know how you get a zoning permit for that kind of thing. We continue in the story. One of the lesser gods named Anu creates wind and streams all over the face of the world. This disturbs his mother, Tiamat. She apparently has very thin skin. And then some of the other gods whisper in her, he, in her, in her ear and say, Hey, don't you remember that the first time you got perturbed at your kids, it ended up with the murder of your husband? Are you really going to let this guy get away with that? And so Tiamat decides, yeah, you know, I've kind of had it. So she creates an army of monsters and beasts, the chief commander of whom and the mightiest soldier in is named King Nu. The lesser gods get wind of Tiamat's plot, and so they start to concoct ways to dissuade her. First, they send A to go to try to defeat Tiamat. He loses. Then they say to Anu, hey, would you go try to talk your mom out of this? He chickens out and won't do it. So eventually they talk to a god named Marduk. And they say to Marduk, will you go try to defeat Tiamat? And if you do, we'll make you the chief among all the gods. And so, lo and behold... Combat ensues between Marduk and Tiamat. This is how it ends. Tiamat opens her big mouth up to swallow Marduk whole. And he then sends a strong wind down her throat to hold her jaw open. And into her open mouth he shoots an arrow. And it strikes her in the heart and kills her. From her dead body... Marduk cuts her in half. From one half of her body, he makes the sea. From the other half of the body, he makes the earth. From her two eyes, he makes the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the most important rivers in Mesopotamia, or modern Iraq. It is only after defeating Tiamat that all the other gods say, we will live up to our bargain and we will make you, Marduk, the chief among all the gods, the one supreme god over all of us, lesser gods. At the end of the story, as it begins to wrap up, you hear that, oh, Marduk decides after this great climactic battle, I think we'll make human beings now. They are called in ancient Akkadian Lulus. Lulus means barbarians or simpletons. This is how the Babylonian creation myth views humanity. We are Lulus, barbarians, or simpletons. And the only reason we're made is to serve the gods, to cater to their every whim. In fact, we are told that the lesser gods make humanity out of the blood of Tiamat and her armies. The story ends with Marduk making Babylon the city and its temples, and declaring himself their God. And then it finishes with a few lines 
of extended praise to the great god Marduk. This is what the entire known world believed about creation 3,500 years ago. And this is what Genesis chapter 1 was written to debunk. It was written to defy it. It was written to subvert it. If you are familiar with the biblical creation account, you probably already have several places where you're thinking, yeah, there is stark contrast between what the Bible thinks about creation and what that ancient tale or myth was trying to say. And if you really, as a Christian person, want to understand what the Bible has to say about creation, you have to put yourself in the place of an ancient Hebrew and listen to that contrast or that comparison. Let me help you do that. In the ancient world, as exemplified in the story of Enuma Elish, this is what you are told about creation. You are told that in creation there are many, 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 many gods. And these gods don't get along. They fight each other all the time. And lo and behold, no surprise to anyone, guess who the winner of the whole conflict was? It was our God. Our people's God. Did you catch the, the, uh, the connection? This is a, an ancient creation story told by the Babylonian people. Who was the triumphant God at the end of Enuma Elish? Marduk. The Babylonian God. Our God won. Not yours. Ours. It's territorial. It's parochial. Our God. What does Genesis 1 and 2 say? Hey, there's only one God. Just one. He is unrivaled and undisputed. And He is the God of all peoples. He is the father of all humanity. He cares about everyone alike. He is not just our God and not yours. An ancient Israelite would have heard that when they read Genesis 1 and 2 and compared it to what their world was telling them about creation and the origin of the universe. And see, if we're going to be biblically informed people, that concept there on the right has to continue to be one of those things that we hold dear about how we understand the universe, how it started, where life came from, came from this creation versus evolution debate. So you know that you may be running a little too far if... You think that the universe is open-ended and we have no idea where it's headed. That its progress or quote-unquote evolution is unknown, unplanned, unguided. And we don't know how this whole thing ends. See, that runs afoul of what Genesis 1 and 2 is saying. No. There is one God who was intimately involved in the entire creative process. There is only one God who stands over all things. There is only one God who is guiding and wooing creation and humanity toward His desired end. To think that it is not guided by the one true God is to run outside of the parameters set so long ago by this stark, new, refreshing way of looking at the world and its origin. God has no rivals in the Bible's perspective. The world is in conflict from the Scripture's perspective. There is an ancient, old, you might even say timeless, struggle between good and evil in the Scriptures. But do not think that good and evil are parallel forces. No, it's exactly the opposite. In the view of the Scripture, it's like this. Good is that much more powerful than evil. 
Because good is associated with this one true God. And because good and God are so much more powerful than any evil that can ever happen, we are assured of how the world will end. And where it's headed. And what God's purposes in it are. And when we think about God and who He is or who He favors, we should never commit the same error that the Babylonians did so long ago, which is to think in terms of our God. Our God is right. Our God is conceived of correctly. Our God cares for us more than He cares for you. You realize, right, the Bible's creation account was written to destroy that very perspective. No. God does not care more about one culture or country or people or expression of the Christian faith than He does others. Such says the biblical account in Genesis 1 and 2. He is the whole world's God. Genesis chapter 1 envisions God's goodness as four rivers spreading out over the face of the entire planet. Not limited to one region, not limited to one group, everybody. This is why St. Paul in your New Testament in Ephesians chapter 3 says that we call God the Father of all nations and peoples. Revelation says we look forward to the time when people from all nations and tongues will worship God right along with us. We don't fall prey to this territorial idea of God. No, the Bible was written to defeat that idea. Here's another ancient conception about the created order. As you heard in my summary of Enuma Elish. Creation is just as old as the gods. In fact, it is linked with them. Did you catch that? At the start of Enuma Elish, there are only two gods. Father God, Mother God. There's Apsu and Tiamat, who are the fresh water and the sea water. So you have deity and the created order equated in some way. And then all their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are equated with the sky or the land or whatever. The other thing you heard is that creation in that story just it kind of seems to be maybe part of the story, but it seems to be neutral. It seems like it doesn't matter a great deal. Um, it really kind of seems ancillary or marginal to this fight that was going on between these cosmic forces that they called gods. And see, the biblical account in Genesis 1 and 2, it does not look at creation that way at all. It expresses something new in the ancient world because it says two things. Number one, creation and God, yeah, they're not the same thing. They are differentiated. And you should never equate the two. And one of the refrains in your Bible through Genesis 1 and 2 about creation is not that it's neutral. Even if you're only somewhat vaguely familiar with the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2, I bet you know the refrain. After every single day of creation, the God of the Bible says, and it was good. It's not just a minor character in the story. It's not something you can leave behind or ignore and still get the point of what's going on. No. The God of the Bible says creation is good. There is inherent value to it. It is, in fact, uplifting. See, same thing. If you want to be biblically informed people, you want to be Bible-believing people about creation and the origin of all things, then you need to listen to this lesson that an ancient Hebrew would have taken from Genesis 1 and 2. Number one, creation and God are not the same things. Sometimes when you hear evolution talked about today, it is as if its laws, the things that govern evolution, are unrivaled and they can be unchallenged. For instance, we talk about things like how species develop 
according to survival of the fittest. And that no species at any time, human beings included in the year 2013, can ever get outside of this law that governs all things called the survival of the fittest. Things like gravity, things like time, things like light speed are all taken to be scientific, timeless norms that are unchallenged and unrivaled. This is not the Christian perspective. You could buy into everything I just said, you just need to add a sentence. Those things are laws that were made and designed by God Almighty. Who, if he so chooses can break them, bend them, do what he wants within them. You cannot equate creation and those things that are immutable or unchangeable in the world. From a biblical perspective, at the root of all things, beneath all things, above all things, is God himself. And don't miss the point. If you listen to someone today who is an advocate for evolution oftentimes who doesn't think that God was very involved in the process, you are left to conclude that what's happened in our universe over the billions of years that it's existed, you could take it or leave it. It could have happened this way, it could have happened another way. It doesn't really matter. And all you are is one little organism on one little planet in one little galaxy in the far reaches of the vast universe. Sometimes creation is seen as cruel and unkind or something to be exploited. None of these things fit into the Bible's way of talking about creation. Creation from the Bible's standpoint is good. It is not neutral. It is not negative. It is not something to be consumed or exploited or worn out. It is good. C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, writer, Christian writers from the last century in England, would say of God that you know what God is at heart? He is the most joyous being in the universe. What defines God as God is that He can find great joy, more joy than anybody else in all things. You see that in the creation story. That God looked at everything He was making and the way things were coming together and the variety and the diversity and the beauty and the color and He looked at it and said, I say about this, it is good. And when you have those moments of looking at creation big or small, past or present, And you sense in you that same awe. You sense in you that same joy that is one of those moments when you are most feeling like God Himself. You are saying with Him, this is good. This is worth preserving and protecting and nurturing. This is good. Any view of the origin of the universe has to conform to this perspective doesn't matter if you believe in evolution or not. It has to look like that in order to be biblical. Two more. In Enuma Elish, what did the world world 3,500 years ago believe about the gods themselves? Well, I don't know about you, but they act like children, right? They act like human beings at our worst. They are flawed. They are overtly evil. You had in that story how many deaths at the hands of other gods? You had plots. You had scheming. You had jealousy. This is what the world thought about God 3,500 years ago. This is what the gods were like. And Genesis 1 and 2 comes along and says, no. You are so underselling what the divine is like. You are falsely equating your behavior with his behavior. Now, in Genesis 1 and 2, the best character in the story is God. The one who should be most emulated is God. 
He is benevolent. He is wise as He cultivates and plans and creates. He is kind and provides for human beings that He makes. It is an altogether different view of God in your Bible than what the world back then thought. And that would be the lesson for us to keep in mind today. As we pull forward this this lesson that really can only be understood when you set it in its cultural context, we have to remember that what we think about the origin of life or the cosmos needs to make sure that it keeps this view of God intact. One of the ways that people will talk about God's involvement in creation or the coming of being of the universe is they talk about him in the manner of a deist. A deist says, yeah, you know, there is this guy named God, but way back at the Big Bang, he's the guy who lit the match. And then the bomb blew up and all the matter in the known universe came into existence. And from that day hence, billions of years ago, God has stepped back and played indifferent. He started the whole mess, and then he let it go its own course, without guidance, without input, without a care. To that, we look at this and say, well, you know, I don't think that that fits with the kind of God that we see in Genesis 1 and 2. Who cared about what he was making. Who wisely designed and planned it. Who guided it along. Who wanted to nurture and tend it like his own garden. Who cared about its positive end or outcome. This is what the biblical God's involvement looks like. The aloof, indifferent God that some might conjecture today doesn't fit with that. This needs to be your paradigm for how you view things. I don't care how involved or not involved you think evolutionary process was. Your God at the end needs to look like that. And your God needs to be involved in a way that that God would. And you know you're okay. You're fitting within the perspective of the Scripture itself. And maybe the most drastic difference between how the world back then viewed creation and life and the origin of all things and the Bible itself has to do with us. Did you catch it? In the most well-known creation myth of the time, 3,500 years ago, humanity is an afterthought. You have this cosmic battle between all these different cosmic forces or gods. And they're vying for and against each other. And then, oh yeah, at the end, gosh, you know, we're so tired, we don't want to work for ourselves, so we're going to create some menial servants. And we're going to call them Lulus, barbarians, simpletons, human beings, because they're so beneath us. And they will live to serve our every whim. This is not how the Bible views humanity. And every ancient Hebrew's ears would have perked up when they listened to the words of Genesis 1 and 2 because what it says is almost 180 degrees different than what their culture around them was saying. In your Bible, humanity is the very pinnacle of creation. It doesn't get any better than us. We have an unrivaled place in what God has done in making the world and life. It is said about us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, that we are the only thing in the universe that bears God's image and has His likeness. There is something about us More than a supernova, more than all of the antelope in Africa, there is something about us that is superior and distinct that makes us like God Himself. We are told the chapter later, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, that God gives humanity the mission of tending and nurturing the earth. Guess in Genesis chapter 1 whose job that was? God's. 
God hands down to humanity his very job in the pages of Genesis 1 and 2. This is how the Bible views us. Can you imagine what it would have felt like if you were an ancient Israelite hearing this account of the creation of all things for the first time? Can you imagine what that would have done to you? How uplifting it would have been. How empowering it would have been. How you never would have viewed yourself or other people or your role in the world the same because of it. And can you imagine how appealing this perspective is as opposed to the one the rest of the culture around you had? And so my claim to you is, Christian person, if you really want to be a Bible-believing person and believe what the Bible is saying in the setting that it did, you need to believe something very distinct and high about the human race. Here's what the human race isn't. It's not just another species. Regardless of what evolutionary process you think might be involved, we can differ on that. Here's what I know we can't. Human beings are remarkable. We are, in fact, the capstone of creation. From a biblical perspective, it will never get any better than us. You realize that? We're it. And now we have been given the grave responsibility of caring for all of God's creation in His place. We are to represent Him. We are to speak for Him. We are to be like His image and likeness on earth. Whatever you think about the science of the origin of the universe, whatever you think about the history of the human race and how it does or does not relate to the animals around us, you as a Christian person need to hold this close. We are remarkable people, capable of unique things, as the Bible itself says. And what you think about evolution and creation needs to reflect that. So, this has been your tour, your awakening, if you will, to what the Bible actually says in Genesis 1 and 2 about creation and evolution. And as I said at the outset of the message, you know what? Those who want to try to force those chapters of the Bible into the debate of whether or not there is evolutionary process involved in the making of all things or human life, they're missing the point. That is not what the passage is about. But when you let it speak in its own voice and you hear it the way it would have been heard back then, it is oh so powerful and oh so eye-opening. And it grounds us, even though we may disagree, about some of the particulars in this debate. This is how a Christian expert in the issue of creation and evolution and how things started, this is how this expert named Dan Harlow summarizes what Genesis 1 and 2 says and does not say. And how we need to be very careful to pay attention to the difference. He writes, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 tells us nothing about the age or size of the universe, about the physical processes by which either the earth itself or life on earth developed. But it tells us everything about the supremacy of God, the goodness of creation, and the dignity of all human beings. These are Christian spiritual truths that are timeless and about which all of us need to agree. Back in the 80s, many uh, denominations were locked in a struggle over this issue. Some of the denominations you're familiar with around here were too as well. For instance, the Christian Reformed Church in America was locked in a debate about how they would view whether or not evolution could be involved in the development of the universe or human life. And they very wisely worked hard together and deliberated together, and they came up with a statement that reads like a poem. 
that emphasizes what the Bible does and leaves open what the Bible does not say clearly and allows for difference. They have now passed this since the mid-80s into law or rule, if you will. If you go to a CRC church, they, by their writing, say that this is what you need to think too. And honestly, I don't know that I've ever seen it said better than this. I don't know that I've ever seen what Genesis 1 and 2 says summarized better and then also leaving open what needs to be left open. This is called our world belongs to God. Our world belongs to God, not to us or earthly powers, not to demons, fate, or chance. The earth is the Lord's. In the beginning, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit called this world into being out of nothing and gave it shape and order. God formed the land and the sea and the sky, making the earth a fitting home for plants, animals, and humans that He created. The world was filled with color and beauty and variety. It provided room for work and play, worship and service, love and laughter. And then God rested and gave us rest. In the very beginning, everything was very good. And even now, as history unfolds in ways we know only in part, we are assured that God is with us in our world. He holds all things in His tender embrace. And He bends them to His purpose. The confidence that the Lord is faithful gives meaning to our days and hope to our years. The future is secure simply because the world belongs to God. Would you pray with me?